well, let's begin. Uh, so it's nice to meet you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, very nice to meet you. Uh, uh, should I give a one minute introduction and set up the context and uh, we can go from there? Yeah, please do. Sure. Um, so my background is a cross between uh, technology, um, uh, AI, generative AI in particular, and now uh, and like an HR background uh, with big four firms like you know Accenture, etc. Um, my latest uh, thing is that I am a, a non-profit AI researcher, uh, and we are, we are doing a challenge with um, this organization called the Learning Agency Lab. Um, so they do some, uh, you know, cutting edge research work uh, on on how to leverage uh, data science, uh, AI uh, for different learning interventions. Um, you know, although their focus is uh, a bit on the ed tech side, um, but you know, I believe that there may be L and implications of that as well. So there is a particular, uh, you know, technology that is relatively newer uh, you know invention last two years and uh, of late which is catching up which is called generative ai uh, which means that you know we are increasingly able to create um, a content based upon uh, like uh, by giving various prompts and it can be various type of content as you know we are all aware it can be written content image content even video content and so forth um, so as far as, uh, you know, uh, content, uh, video content and like written content, uh, the, the use cases are, you know, uh, pretty simple to assume that let's say we wanted to create like uh, learning content videos, probably we can give a command and we would be able to create a video. Perhaps that is something that we could, you know, use it in the L&D context. Um, but my question here is on a very uh, specific kind of, a, you know, um, uh, technological element uh, and uh, whether you, you would see that as an application broadly uh, from a concept point of view and then we'll come to the technology point of view and from the concept point of view is feedback in learning uh, essentially. So how important is feedback in learning? Because what we, uh, because the context, I'll build a little story here. So for example, let's say there are live classes, cohort based classes or any sort of, uh, you know, learning interventions we do. Uh, but there, because of the economics of how it is structured, uh, there is always a constraint on uh, how much time the instructor and the you know students can spend one on one. And obviously, like economically, it is not feasible for that to happen, um, like at scale. But, you know, maybe once or twice it might happen, but it is not a sort of a system. Um, so, uh, in, in that sense, you know, feedback is essentially in the group and is limited. Um, so that even before we bring in technology into the picture, I just wanted to ask like that, would you like, how valuable do you think feedback loop is in learning and, uh, uh, and what are the possible places we can, um, you know, uh, think of have, where feedback has most value in the learning continuum. All right. So I think feedback is critical. Um, in learning. It's also critical in performance back on the job, uh, should this be enterprise learning versus educational learning. But uh, regardless, in a learning context, feedback is critical. Either I do something or ask a question and I am given either uh, reinforcing feedback that mm -hmm. tells me that I've got it right or it gives me corrective feedback that tells mm -hmm. me I didn't get it right, and it can guide me then to the, the better understanding, the right answer, depending on the mechanism we're using for getting feedback. So um, when mm -hmm. I do instructional design, I'm generally okay. uh, creating a chain of okay. learning uh, activities. And, uh, Generally, it starts with giving information, then okay. providing a demonstration, and then an application exercise. So practice with feedback. And that's how I like to always frame application exercises that I'm going to do. It's practice. So I was told something, I was shown something, and now I'm going to do something, which in a way is feedback for the 
uh, instructor or facilitator, or if it's um, an e-learning course, it's feedback to the mechanism there that says Guy is getting this right, or Guy is didn't get it, didn't understand it, can't apply it. And so that's feedback for the learning intervention itself. But, but from a learner's standpoint, to build my competence, my performance competence, and my confidence, my performance mm -hmm. confidence, I need feedback. I need something that tells me that I'm either getting it right or not. And uh, I could be learning some uh, uh, awareness level content, some knowledge level content, or some skill level content, or something that really looks like my performance. So I could have been given information in a demonstration on how to create uh, a spreadsheet that was really an income or a balance sheet or mm -hmm. a cash flow analysis. And I'd be given the information uh, and then I'd be given a demonstration of, you know, what, what I'm expected to do back to the job, theoretically. I should be, I should, you know, if I knew how, how, what a spreadsheet was and how to open it and how to create the columns and rows, et cetera, and label them appropriately and put in the equations, um, I should be then ready to see a demonstration of that. And what I like to do as a designer is I like to have a demonstration that is really a preface, a preview to the learner of the practice with feedback exercise that they're going to do. So tell me something, show me something, and then have me do what you told me and, sh and showed me. So when I'm doing that practice, I can need feedback. And one of the things that I learned from one of the gurus back in the uh, 80s and 90s was that feedback, he in fact wanted it to be called mm -hmm. feedback technology, uh, which he said was just as important as instructional technology, mm -hmm. which is the application of science uh, regarding Got instruction uh, or learning. And uh, but, but he said that, uh, and this always with me and it was similar to what I thought but he gave me words for this and that was feedback is important after you've done the exercise but it's even more important before you do the next exercise he, one of the things he said is that uh, I can't cite the research but but explain that it gave me negative feedback that I didn't do so well on the first exercise by the time I do the second exercise, I might have discounted all of your feedback and said, no, you're wrong. I, I really did better than that. And, and what I really need is to be reminded of that feedback, which was hopefully reinforcing, but sometimes it needs to be corrective. God, you didn't do it right. Here's where you, you did it wrong. If you do this differently, better, correctly, then the feedback will be good. So now that I've given you the feedback, Second time, right? You know, the first time right after I did the practice exercise, and the second time, right after I do it next so that it's fresh in my mind and I don't have time to necessarily discount it. I've got to go do the practice exercise with that feedback cool. in place in my head. So that should guide my performance. Uh, and, and so, again, feedback is critical, it shapes the learner's progression of learning things. Um, you're taking the learner from simple practice to a little bit difficult practice to more complicated practice to what I like to call from hate or hellacious practice. But, you know, the worst case scenario, if I'm learning how to do that and my go the goal is to get me to be able to handle a very complicated, messy situation, you incrementally build my confidence and my confidence up that I can handle that. And you need to give me feedback all the way so that I can correct my mistakes the next time I do something and even deal with additional challenges in the second or third or fourth time I practice. Uh, that was a long answer. I'm sorry, but that's, uh, but I think feedback is very, very critical and um, it's most important when I'm applying what I'm learning, uh, either on real work or 
did real work, etc. Got it. Okay. So, uh, so now that we sort of agree that yes, it, it's a very important component of uh, learning. Um, then let's see that how it is currently embedded in our, uh, you know, daily life tools or whatever the learning technologies currently we are using or I, I and you are currently using, right? So it means mostly uh, in my experience, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, feedback comes from, let's say, doing an, you know, a quiz type of a thing wherein I am selecting one answer out of the possible and it is telling me uh, you know on the click of a button it is telling me that okay whether whether i choose the right answer uh, and what should have been the right answer etc um, or i am doing like a test and after the uh, sort of a test i am getting a score and an analysis that okay again that okay i am correct in 70 percent 80 percent or whatever that score is and that sort of represents uh, like uh, xyz about me or this is where i stand broadly uh, and all of that uh, so what i so where am i where i am going with this is that mostly i see uh, you know feedback uh, tools uh, that are currently being used are uh, are heavily quantitative feedback. That means uh, like either you are right or wrong in this, and this is why you are right and wrong. Um, but I, I believe there are uh, certain situations uh, uh, which actually are like more realistic and practical situations uh, from everyday uh, business situations. Uh, for example, let's say a, a sales manager has to do a demo of a product uh, to, let's say, a situation where a manager has to take a performance appraisal of an employee or, uh, let's say, a product manager uh, launching a new product. So all of these various situations uh, are very soft in nature, whereby uh, there and all of these situations like there can be numerous i gave a few uh, but all of these situations have uh, are based upon a sort of an interaction that i am having during uh, the period when i am performing the job and uh, a set of like um, a set of conversations or a set of interaction so during these set of interactions uh, I believe I, uh, the, the, you know, the participant displays some uh, knowledge, uh, insight and his expertise when he is responding or saying something uh, as, uh, as a matter of fact during, during them. And, uh, and obviously there is uh, you know, not an easier way currently to give us uh, some, uh, to, for the learner to get some sort of a feedback depending upon like what he just said. So, for example, if uh, if I were to ask you that, uh, you know, uh, you know, guy, please tell me the five fundamental principles of LND that everybody should apply. So let's say you give me an answer and then I have to tell you as a human like feedback, um, guy, I think, uh, you know, three of your points were absolutely correct. But you know what? The last two points, I kind of don't agree, but maybe this is how you should frame it and all of that. So this is a very human like feedback which is only possible when there is a human to human interaction. Uh, it is not uh, easily possible today to have such a kind of a, you know, feedback which is human like generated by the machine. So, uh, and that is exactly the technology that we are working on to generate such a kind of feedback via the machine as you would normally expect to be generated by a person. Um, so, uh, I am very interested to know from you that what are the possible uh, like use cases scenarios where we can embed this generative feedback to make the actions of the, uh, you know, uh, certain set of employees uh, or cert sort certain functions better. Uh, e like, you know, you can be honest and say that, okay, this is nonsense, doesn't work, uh, I I'll take that. But if you see that there are users, uh, please do. Well, there there are. So so the one question is, do you want to give immediate feedback so people can self-correct in process? So if I'm doing a performance appraisal hmm. and I start off with the wrong answer or the I, I start off wrong, poorly, hmm. do you want to correct me right then and there or are you going to wait till I'm all done? Both so that's one of the decisions right. that has to be made right. about would that be disruptive to the performance, because if you're trying to do this while people are performing, right. there is a time and a place to give feedback. Right. Now, if I'm going to endanger myself or somebody else, 
you want to give me feedback right then and there. You want to stop the whole process and get me to do something more correctly. Correct. So there's uh, many, many use cases for this. And if the AI was observing me doing the work, mm -hmm. it and it was programmed appropriately, yeah. it could send me uh, a, basically a text message or send me some sort of feedback uh, that may be discernible by me only, but not everybody else in the room. So maybe something would come up on my laptop or on my phone. Mm -hmm. or my my phone would, uh, in my pocket, would uh, vibrate or it would vibrate, you know, two times instead of four times. Mm -hmm. Some sort of feedback to me that I was doing it correctly or incorrectly. Now, giving me that feedback that, that I did something correctly encouraged uh, encourages me to go on and continue. Mm -hmm. and, and then maybe I hit. So one of the things, about, you know, doing a performance appraisal or lo launching a, a product, those are complicated chains mm -hmm. of performance. Yes. And so one of the first things that you need to do is do a, what's what's typically called in um, in manufacturing circles, a work breakdown structure. Yes. And it's, it's similar to our ADDI model. You do analysis first, then you do design, then you do development, then you do implementation evaluation well every every process every workflow can be broken down into chunks or key results areas or major duties or accomplishments or areas of performance many different names for the segmentation of performance so once you segmented it you'd want to segment it so that be, by this is the point we should tell guy the performer he's doing okay or not. And then you would, so you would segment your workflow to buy the places where feedback would be appropriate because mm -hmm. you could do feedback too soon or too late. Yep. And, and so there's a time and a place to do that. So if you were to take any performance situation, right. you could break it down and decide here's the point where I would give feedback. Right. Now, as long as it didn't disrupt the performance, yep. but if, if, if I'm, if I'm, to shape the behavior of people, then I can give that feedback at certain points. Okay. And there's different mechanisms to do that. It depends on, you know, the performance context. Am I in a room with a computer? Am I in the, on the bus riding with somebody? You know, how, what mechanism will we use to give that feedback? Will that feedback be some sort of uh, uh, a vibration? Will it be uh, uh, audio feedback? Will it be some sort of video? feedback how you know so that depends on the performance context but but i think that that would be if somebody is just gone through training for example mm -hmm. and then go and do the job mm -hmm. maybe that's the time and a place to continue giving feedback to shape that performance they learned about something in a classroom or an e-learning module or something like that right. now they're going to go do it in the real world correct so so then i think that the, what the designers need to do is figure out what's the segmentation of process, workflow, or whatever you want to call it. Yep. Um, and then how will we give the feedback in this particular performance situation? Correct. Because they're all different, and sometimes we can give it on the computer in the corner of the screen. Sometimes we need to give a little ding, ding, bell sound from someplace. Right. Uh, sometimes we give the the, uh, the virus feedback so that, that people know to continue or they need to stop because the feedback, they didn't do that correctly. Got it. And either, either the situation and the environment allows to give specific guidance now, guy, you did that poorly. Here's what you, you need to back up a step and start all over again. And this is what you need to say. Or this is what you need to do. And, and the, the richer that feedback, the more explicit mm -hmm. and direct it is, the better it would be for the performer who is still learning. They're out of a formal learning environment, right. and now they're in a work environment, right. but we can still give them feedback. So sometimes I get feedback naturally where I'm dealing with a customer and they say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Yes. Well, that's feedback. Yes. Or, or I could explain something, but the customer is being polite, right. and now AI comes in and says, gives me the the feedback that tells me that I didn't get that right. So then I stop and go, well, let me try that all again one more time. And so that's what we're trying to do is 
is give people feedback uh, in the performance context mm -hmm. to shape their behaviors and to continue their learning outside of the formal learning. Now it's really just an extension of formal learning back out under the job. Correct, correct, uh, absolutely. So, so if I understood um, you correctly, I, I believe that uh, some kind of a pre-job simulation is uh, an, you know, a pre-job sandbox or a pre-job trial uh, scenario is an ideal environment probably, which I also, you know, got a feedback from others. So that is great. That is in line. Um, well, uh, so that, that depends on a couple of things. And part of it is my prior knowledge. Hmm. If you're asking me to sell this new product, which is kind of similar to this product I've been selling for five years, right. well, then you don't need to do that. You can give me some information about the differences benefits, what kinds of questions, Correct. People, and then I can do it. Correct. Or you can simply say, guy, here's a new product, sell it. Correct. And, and, and so um, a, a lot of it depends on the prior required to do the performance Correct. and what kind of prior knowledge and skills do I bring to that situation. Correct. But you know, yes, most of the time, new hires in particular, Correct. you need to give them a chance to practice in a very safe environment and not you know, live uh, in, uh, in the workflow right. in real work. You want to simulate that real work right. previously right. to help, again, build the competence and confidence of people. Right. Because otherwise, you're throwing them into the deep end of the pool, right. as is often said. Yes. And you're expecting them to swim without having given them any swimming lessons or practice uh, beforehand. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. So yes, uh, either that or if there is supposedly a change in the process, for example, let's say there is a customer onboarding process and that has undergone a drastic change. So now before we throw the agent to the live customers, the agent should get himself familiarized with the simulated environment and then go and do the job with the customers that is onboarding them. Something. Okay, I, I get it. Yeah, that, no, that's yeah, that's a classic situation because new hires need to learn the new process. Yes. They don't need to learn the new <laughs> But the yes. incumbent performers yes. need to understand what's right. new and different. And if it's right. tricky, maybe we Correct. need them to practice the tricky part of it. Or maybe it's sufficient to just say, hey, you, can set, you know, when you do A, you do B, you do C. Now, D and E are right. different, and here's how. And, and maybe they know. They understand exactly what to do. They don't need to practice or see a demonstration. They can just be told. So... The way to decide whether you need to just tell somebody the differences and or show them the differences and or have them practice the differences is by testing. So you do A and B testing to see, you know, what does this target audience that we're trying to impact, you know, what do they need? Do they need to be just told? Do they need to be told and shown? Do they need to be told and shown and practice something Got before it. they go live? Okay. Fair, fair point. Right. No, um, I think uh, uh, I have understood sort of the flow of uh, like how this goes. Um, and uh, now, um, so uh, let me come to uh, a piece where I, I don't know if this is, if this comes under like a consulting engage, so be it, uh, please feel free to share if that is the way we need to move forward, if we need to accomplish this. But here's what I wanted to do. Um, so right now there are many, uh, you know, these one-way video interviews, one-way audio interview softwares that are available readily uh, of the market, right? So there are plenty of them which we can get. So I wanted to uh, use those, one of those same soft, uh, like softwares that are readily available and um, build out an interview-like scenario where when I build any, let's say an onboarding scenario or any scenario through a series of interview questions, and the person like responds in a sequence. And uh, I then wanted to put the, you know, responses collected into our AI engine, generate that feedback report. And I then wanted to share it with possibly the person who took the test slash interview and maybe their manager and get some feedback from them that, hey, whether, uh, whether they believe that this feedback is uh, useful for them or what did they need to see and whether they agree with the scores and some other softer things that 
the software is predicting like you know their confidence body language energy tone and what all of those stuff along with very uh, human like feedback that hey you did these parts well not these parts try to add more of this reduce this and all of that stuff so uh, hard things and soft things together combined in a report uh, after you have done the interaction um, is what i needed some uh, like feedback on from let's say a smaller uh, population and you know ideally um i don't know like an lnd department of a company uh, if you if you could so uh, and uh, you know so so if you can guide us that how do we go about uh, doing that and if you have any advice for a consultant who could uh, who could help me do that or if you uh, do that or how could we possibly do this well i'm i'm 70 years old here, so i'm kind of retired so i'm not actively looking for work but there are people that could help you uh, create um, the the first of all, you have to uh, define you know what's the what's the situation where we want okay. to affect. Okay. And is it onboarding? And and when we onboard people, so you can ask questions or give information and take the questions from the person okay. being onboarded because that's really critical feedback mm -hmm. to the onboarding okay. design. Uh, however, that's okay. being deployed. Um, and, and so if the onboarding doesn't tell me things and I have 27 questions, well, obviously the onboarding didn't answer the 27 questions. And if you did, if you took my questions, my 27 questions and the 10 people before me and the 10 people after me, and they all had about 15 questions each, you could find out what are the common questions that people have when they've gone through the onboarding experience. And then we determine how we can best answer them. Because sometimes if I have a lot of questions about something, then, then I'm probably not even sure that I asked all my questions. Those were the 27 I could think of. And then I worry that maybe there was other things that I missed I didn't understand. And so that creates anxiety. So what you want to do is decide to proactively address the questions that people have and answer them in the onboarding experience and maybe some of those should be best be answered by the frequently asked questions or answers at the end of the onboarding experience, part of the onboarding experience at the end, or sometimes at the very beginning. Because answering the frequently asked questions at the very beginning might help me, the person being onboarded, to ask even better questions of the onboarding experience. Now, if I'm dealing with uh, uh, e-learning or a video and not people, I can't ask those questions of them, but if I can ask a chat box, uh, a, a, an artificial intelligence agent of some sort, here's my questions and they can answer me, well, then I'm, I'm good. I don't need a human being necessarily to answer all of those questions. But, but so I think that, that so when you said we're talking about giving feedback, Feedback to whom, for what purpose? Because feedback is a two-way street. If you are on board, I can give you feedback about, you know, here's what my questions are that weren't answered. So that's feedback to you. Uh, you could ask me questions. Maybe I had to do some work and, you know, memorize things and know certain facts. And maybe I didn't. I did know some and I didn't know others. And you can give me that feedback. So, so feedback in this situation from the learner or the person being onboarded, they, that feedback can shape the onboarding experience. Um, the feedback from the onboarding experience back to me can help me understand, here's what I've got to work on before I get into the job. I knew these facts, but I didn't know those facts. Um, now, you mentioned earlier, you know, we can score these things. Um, and to me, scores are, you know, I remember people questioning, why is 80% correct a right. good score? Shouldn't it be 100 right. And so it depends on whether it's a life and right. death yes. situation or or this is the beginning and you'll learn right. things over time. The other thing is that there's soft and hard skills right. you referenced. And, and, and soft skills are, this is a, this, 
back to a guy named Joe Harless, the late Joe Harless in the mid 80s. Soft skills are simply things that we haven't defined yes. well enough. So they yes. seem soft, but actually there's a process. Communication skills, interpersonal skills of various types, active listening, um, various communications. All those things are somewhat soft until we say, here's where they apply. If I'm doing a sale, that's where my soft skills apply. That makes them harder because we're doing a sale. We're not we're not uh, uh, giving a toast at a at a wedding. We're, we're yes. making a sale, and so there's a specific application, and that tends to make soft skills mm -hmm. harder. And when we get specific about the performance, the performance performance context, we make softer things harder and more to define good and bad uh, and neutral, and we can give feedback then accordingly. But I'm giving a toast at a, at a, at a wedding. You know, who would say that was good or not unless I offended the bride's mother or something? Um, and so, and so, I, so I think the notion of soft, I wanted to speak to this about the soft skills because I don't think there is anything such as soft skills unless we don't define application of them. And when we don't, when we, and too often learning and development stays soft. They talk about behaviors, not the context, not the right. work. They talk about knowledge or skills, but they don't talk about how you apply them in the world. And then they leave soft and fuzzy. And therefore, we can only give feedback on what you know. We can't give you feedback on what you can do. And the important thing in enterprise learning is to focus on what we expect people to do. Then we want to know, what do you need to know in order to be able to do? So our in enterprise learning, educational learning, where we don't know what the whole class is going to have, uh, in an enterprise learning, we can focus in on, we want to teach people X, Y, Z for what reason? Because they apply here and here and here job and we know there's three places they apply that no kidding and so therefore we be very explicit in our instruction and the information the demonstration and the application exercise correct we put um, i agree very much on all the points um but i just came from the perspective that it is the organization's uh, sme their learning executives to define what scenario they need what questions they need to be tested and all of that stuff. So in which I can hardly, as an outsider, provide any input. They know their organization the best. They have to, like, you know, uh, understand. They have. But they are but they are not the uh, performance-based learning experts. This is when we rely on a subject matter expert. There's a, several issues here. When we rely on a subject matter expert, they sometimes think that they need to give us hmm. everything and give that to the learner. And the rule is less is more. More is not more. More is less. If we, because we can overload people and, and cognitively overload them so that they stop learning before we're done with them because we've simply given them too much to absorb and they can't absorb it quickly enough. <clears throat> that's, that's one of the issues when we allow an SME to just do a content dump. What we need to do is channel that SME to what's the learner going to do with this information? How will they apply it in their work? Let's focus and understand that first. And then we can decide what's Correct. necessary and what's Correct. extraneous. Um, the second thing about using a, a subject matter expert is what the research shows us is that experts and anybody, you and me, we will leave out 70% of what a novice needs simply because We've automated that knowledge. Our knowledge of how to do Correct. something that's complex, we will have automated the majority of it. Um, and that goes into our non-conscious or unconscious, and we cannot tell you. So if you ask an, a subject matter expert to give you all of the information that people will need on the job, you're going to have incomplete instruction or training or learning because 70% of what that expert knows is non-conscious and they cannot tell you it. You can hold a gun to their head and they can't tell you it because they've automated it and it's not accessible to them. Now they can do the work, but they can't tell you about it. 
And so you have to be very careful. And if you're creating artificial intelligence uh, agents to uh, help with instruction or learning, when we program that artificial agent, we need to have multiple sources because while every expert can tell you approximately 30% of what the novice needs, if you deal with multiple experts, they each know a different 30%. And so you can compare and contrast what they give you as information and the overlaps confirm themselves, but then people say different things and that needs to be factored into what the novice needs in order to perform. And, and so when we're dealing with clients who may wanna teach something, you know, too often, and I've been in this business for 43 years, too often our clients want us to address a topic or a behavior, and they don't see it necessary to, to talk about how does that apply in the work. They have an education model in their heads because everybody's been through the education system. And the education system doesn't tell you, we're going to learn these math equations here because you're going to use them in these seven places in your job in the future. No kidding. No, they don't know right. what you're going to do with this. So they teach it to you, but they can't tell you explicitly what right. you're going to do with that. But we think you need to know this, but but maybe you don't. You know, we don't know. And uh, if you're going to be an engineer, yeah, you'll need them. If you're going to be a, 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 a cook in a restaurant, uh, a chef, you may not need to know any of those equations. Um, so it's just the guess uh, guesswork of the education system. So one of the things that we need to do when we're dealing with clients and they come to us with a request to do address a topic or a behavior, what I like to do with them is at the right point in time, not immediately, uh, because it may seem like a challenge and we shouldn't necessarily challenge the requester, but we sh can ask, so what would the practice with feedback look like? If you want me to teach on this topic, okay, great. Yeah, let me understand that. We can talk about that a little bit. Then I can shift the conversation to, okay, so let's talk about the practice with feedback. What would authentic, real-world application practice with feedback look like? What would they do? When would we, would we give them feedback? Would we wait till the end? Would we give them feedback in, in, at the at the one third mark and the two thirds mark. And then at the three thirds mark, that's where three places we'll give them feedback. So we can talk with an expert about that and shift their perspective from topics Correct. to tasks True. and outputs. True. I know uh, absolute spot on from a client perspective. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, thank you for doing this. Appreciate it. Bye.